Many strange and unusual things can be found on the internet. It's a place that allows us to act and behave without any filter, and often without regulation. Although most of us follow the rules, we all sometimes come across the odd troll, or even experience ominous activity. One of those communities which are most expressive with questionable content is the popular anonymous forum, 4chan. But when images of an undiscovered murder were uploaded alongside a full written confession, even those frequently using the sites were alarmed. And and in the hours that followed, authorities would learn that these dark and twisted messages were actually true, therefore leaving a small Washington community reeling from shock. As some of you will know, coffeehouse crime is no stranger to true crime in the internet, and in fact, some of my online stories are the most requested to date. But from start to finish, this case can only be described as extremely unusual, especially when it came to what the killer left online. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Amber Coplin and David Kalick. By the way, and just to let you know, that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Amber Coplin. Olympic National Park, Mount Rainier, and Seattle. Of course, I'm talking about Washington, so on that note, welcome to the Evergreen State, folks. Now, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to this intriguing corner of the US. With a solid arts culture and an even stronger coffee culture, it is easy to see why this place naturally feels like home to me. In fact, coffee is so important to Seattle that there's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to it. Studies have concluded that there are more than 84 coffee shops per 100,000 residents in Seattle, a figure that's only nationally surpassed by San Francisco at 106. However, the city to claim the international title surprisingly turns out to be Melbourne at a staggering 119. And suddenly, my affinity for this Australian city makes a lot more sense. Anyway, refocusing back in on Seattle, it is almost impossible to walk past a single block without seeing at least one coffee shop. To this day, you can find more than 130 Starbucks shops existing within the city. This makes perfect sense too, considering the company was first founded here in March 1971. Flying over the waters of Puget Sound and found 18 miles west of Seattle, we find ourselves over the tiny city of Port Orchard, a beautiful waterfront community known for its manufacturing, defense, and technology services. Situated between mountains and lakes, it's an atmospheric and quiet place to live. And with thanks to its location, the city offers breathtaking hikes and incredible views of the Olympic Mountains. Saying that, the city sustained one of the state's most violent tornadoes in 2018. With winds at 130 miles per hour, it uprooted trees and damaged almost 500 homes. And considering the population is made up of only 16,000 residents, that's a fair percentage of people affected. The small population means that many faces become familiar over time, and it's here that we find one of those familiar faces, Amber Lynn Coplin. Aged 30 at the time our story takes place, Amber was born on May the 30th, 1984, to her mother Daylene and father James. With five sisters and two brothers, life in the Coplin household was very busy to say the least. However, her parents would eventually split up before remarrying with other partners. Fast forward to her adult life, we find Amber as the loving mother of five children. And with five sons, she and her husband Paul were always busy with the usual chaos that comes with looking after five boys, whose names were Adam. Bryce, Tim, Jason, and James. Unfortunately, Amber and Paul also separated a few years prior, and although they kept in regular contact, it did create a rift between the family, and as a result, the two parents would split their time with their kids between two homes. Amber had also found a new partner too, a man named David Kallak, and by the year 2014, the two were dating and lived together in a two-bedroom apartment near the city. Amber had previously earned her GED, known as a General Educational Development Test, before moving 
moving on to work as a CSR, and eventually a caregiver. By the year 2014, she was working as a claim information agent at State Farm. In addition to this, she had also enrolled herself into school so she could get her qualification in general insurance. To add to her already busy schedule, Amber volunteered herself as a den leader at the local Boy Scouts of America. Despite Amber's and Paul's separation, they mutually enrolled their sons into the Boy Scouts in hopes of teaching them the importance of teamwork. And although this was a noble effort, and Amber clearly wanted the best for her children, it seems as if her own choice in men appeared to be somewhat different. Although the father of her children, Paul, was a very good man, the same couldn't be said for her new boyfriend, David and unfortunately, he had a very troubling history. David's criminal past dates back to 1997 when he was just a teenager. Despite having a comfortable life in Washington with his parents and two brothers, things began to go downhill for him when he turned to using drugs. Court documents show that, as a juvenile, he was charged with negligent driving, operating a vehicle while drunk, and even assault too. And sadly, that was only the beginning. In fact, David had almost 50 criminal infractions spread over a total of 18 separate cases. To begin with, many of these were relatively minor traffic and driving violations. But by the time he had reached adulthood, those offences had escalated to become much more serious. In the year 2011, he was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon. And as some of you may have already guessed, most of these cases did include misusing alcohol. Now, our story takes place in the year 2014, and although he was dating Amber at the time, grave concerns over his behaviour were as recent as eight months prior. In March of that year, he was charged with domestic violence against his former girlfriend, this being after he punched her in the face and also threatened to kill her with a knife. Now, David pleaded guilty to his charge, but sadly was only given a small slap on the wrist. He was given community custody, which is a simple type of probation. Whether Amber knew of his terrible past or not isn't actually clear, but the young and protective mother seemed to be quite comfortable with her boys being around him. Aged 33 at the time, he was three years older than she was. But despite their similar age, his 6 foot 2 inch frame and 220 pounds dwarfed his partner. Amber and David were still a relatively new couple, and recently moving in together, they were still trialling their compatibility. Neighbours would sometimes hear arguments coming from the household, but nothing seemed too serious. And so, for now, they would just have to wait and see how things panned out. November the 4th, 2014. It was around 2.30pm Pacific Daylight Time, and users from all across the world were logging into the forum 4chan. For those of you who don't know, 4chan is a forum that was created in 2003 by Christopher Paul. Originally created to be a forum to discuss Japanese anime and post photos, the image board site soon grew to become much, much more than this, and eventually it became one of the largest websites in the world at the time. The biggest difference between 4chan and other social media platforms is that it allows people to post anonymously, giving many free reign to express themselves without filter. Now, granted, 4chan is home to many iconic pranks, including lolcats and even Rick Rowling. However, it has also led to some very disturbing and violent content being spread, and unfortunately, our story today falls into that category. It was while here and on this day that 4chan users were engaging on the usual threads typically seen across the forum. You know, things like you laugh you lose, general rants, and other questionable content. But that is when, at 2.56pm, a new thread suddenly appeared. Several images of a dead body were posted, along with the caption, Turns out, it's way harder to strangle someone to death than it looks on the movies. She fought so damn hard. After one response, the anonymous poster then followed up with another comment. Check the news for Port Orchard, Washington in a few hours. Her son will be home from school soon. He'll find her, then call the cops. I just wanted to share the pictures before they find me. I bought a BB gun that looks realistic enough. When they come, I'll pull it and it'll be suicide by cop. Users on the forum were alarmed to see the post, though since this forum is heavily exposed to trolling and sarcasm, nobody fully believed it was real. Timestamp, one said. You what mate, wrote another. And one user even replied with, can't tell if low quality bait or huge newbie. It is clear to see that nobody took this post seriously, and even if the pictures were true, it could have been taken from a crime scene months or even years prior. Many of the people who saw this post probably thought it was a very sick individual 
individual who was just merely seeking attention. Anyway, the post remained active for several hours after it was published, with many people responding to the thread. However, at around 7pm, the post was eventually deleted. Though it's not known if this was due to 4chan's self-destruct feature, or if removed by moderator. But unfortunately, little did anyone know that the author of this post was not trolling anyone. Everything he said was entirely true. Just after the post went up, police received a 911 call reporting that a young woman, Amber Coplin, had just been found dead in her apartment bedroom. Responding officers arrived at 3.25pm to find her husband, Paul, standing outside. Entering the property, paramedics rushed into Amber's bedroom to find a highly bizarre and morbid scene. Items were strewn across the room, coins were all over the floor, Amber's purse had been emptied, and her dentures were on the floor. And most notably, her driver's license was found with the word dead scribbled over it. The license was placed on her pillow, and beside it was a pile of blankets. And underneath, they found the body of Amber Coplin. It appeared as if she had been gone for quite some time, as her body was cold to the touch. Police would also find a damaged framed photo of Amber, Someone had scribbled the words, she killed me first, over her face. The window blinds had also been pulled down, and written all over them were the words bad news. It appears as if someone was trying to send them a message. Detectives observed that Amber's face was badly bruised and bloody, and there were bloodstains located on the wall at the head of the bed. It was only after taking a closer look that authorities realised several other haunting details. Amber had been strangled and bitten, and many profanities were written all over her body. And on the nightstand, they found one concerning clue. She had just had an abortion, and the paperwork was right there to go with it. The authorities began to wonder where David was, and as soon as one of Amber's sons told them that she had an argument with him the night before, he immediately became a person of interest. The argument between Amber and David, along with the abortion letter that was found, suggested a possible motive, which highly concerned officers. However, it was only after realising that her gold Ford Focus was missing that the really strong evidence surfaced. This of course being the 4chan post and all chilling images attached. As the investigation unfolded, police learned that Amber and David had argued on the evening of November the 3rd, 2014, with Amber eventually asking him to leave. You see, at the time, Amber was living with David and her 13-year-old son. Halfway through this argument, she entered her son's bedroom to ask for a sleeping bag. And instead of sharing her bed with David, she then asked him to sleep on the couch. Arguments continued for a while after this, but Amber's son drowned the noise out and then headed to bed. The next morning, he got up at around 6am to get ready for school, but the apartment felt strange. Now, usually, David would already be up and getting ready for work, but neither he or his belongings were anywhere to be found. The door to his mother's bedroom was closed, but this was normal for a weekday morning, and Amber would usually get up for work after her son had already left for school. Making his way out of the door and eventually getting to class, her son suddenly became sick. He had somehow developed a very weird feeling in his stomach. It was something he couldn't shake. Texting his mother, he received no response back, and this too seemed to be very, very strange. Calling his father, Paul picked him up shortly before lunchtime, and after being dropped off outside the front door, the nauseous teen headed on inside. But after a nap, a shower, and a snack, he realised that the door to his mother's bedroom was still closed. To add to this, he could smell a very odd stench coming from the other side of the door. And after opening it, he was met with a very traumatic scene. As responding officers began to search the home, David was already miles away posting pictures of Amber's body to 4chan. However, his twisted plans did not start here. It was learned that, on the night of her death, David had crossed the Tacoma Narrows Bridge at 5.33am, likely in a bid to evade the law. At 6.20am, David texted his manager to inform him that he had done something terrible, and that he would likely make the news within a few hours. A few hours later, he texted a friend to say, I fucked up 
really, really bad last night. I'll either be in prison or dead by the end of the day. He then turned off his phone so he couldn't be tracked. Around 1pm that afternoon, a surveillance camera captured David entering a Cash America and pawning a laptop for $125. He then went to a nearby Albertsons store and purchased a 2 litre bottle of vodka and a carton of orange juice. Small side note, but David Kallick was an extreme alcoholic, and his favourite drink was a screwdriver. David then drove to Chehalis and stopped at a Walmart at around 2.30pm, where another surveillance camera showed him purchasing a BB pistol and ammunition. Tactically, the BB gun was a realistic replica of a Beretta-style semi-automatic firearm. After purchasing the gun, a surveillance camera captured him in the parking lot for around 30 minutes. And during this time, and while police were discovering Amber's body, he then uploaded the pictures to 4chan. David then turned his phone off once again, before driving to Portland, Oregon, and after arriving in the evening, he spent several hours at a local bar. With his name barely making the news at the time, no one around him was aware of his evil actions. However, the police were already outside looking for his car. At around 1am, and as we reached the 24 hour mark since Amber's murder, David then got back into the car and drove away. And that is when police recognised him. The man refused to give himself up, which of course prompted a high speed chase between him and several officers. But after driving through incoming traffic, officers called off the chase, therefore allowing David and his Ford Focus to slip into the night. David's disappearance concerned officers, which made sense because under the cover of darkness he could easily avoid detection. It appears as if he was successful with his evasion too, because as the hours passed by, the man still remained at large. It would take officers more than 16 hours to finally locate his vehicle, and by then David himself was nowhere to be seen. However, what would happen next surprised everyone. At approximately 8.45pm, David emerged from the dark depths of the woods. An officer was on patrol in the area, and after spotting this officer, he decided to turn himself in. Following his arrest, officers discovered an abandoned camp in the woods, and within the camp, they found a box spring bed. David had written Dave's last stand on the fabric with a black permanent marker. They also found the BB gun he had purchased, alongside a note which read, I killed Amber Coplin. I strangled her with my hands and then a shoelace. I had no reason other than I was drunk and she pissed me off. Running from the cops was so fun. Uh, late this evening, a Wilsonville police officer was driving through the Smart Park area and had a male walk out of the bushes and approach him. The deputy stopped and got out and talked to the male and he actually uh, identified himself and said that he was wanted out of Washington on a, on a murder. Well, it's, it's very bizarre. Uh, as you know, there's, there's been a, quite the manhunt for him today and uh, a lot of Portland officers out looking for him. We had some reports of him being in the Portland area and very, uh, very unheard of for something like this to happen, but we're glad that it did and it's a, it's a good ending to this. It doesn't appear that he was armed when he was taken into custody. Needless to say, David was arrested immediately before being charged with first degree murder, theft of a motor vehicle and second degree possession of stolen property. While he was getting used to his new life behind bars, Amber's husband and her five kids were faced with the horrible realisation that she was gone forever. To add to this tragedy came the awful difficulty of suppressing those photos online, because as David's post became an obvious reality, those pictures began to circulate. Dealing with the death of a loved one is already hard enough, but Amber's sons were at a very impressionable age, and if they saw those photos, it would be sure to cause great psychological harm. And heartbreakingly, court documents would later confirm that they had in fact seen those photos. Eventually, data forensics would recover several photos of Amber from David's mobile phone. The photos were timestamped between 1.07 and 1.09am on the morning that she was murdered. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, at trial David did not deny that he killed Amber. Instead, he argued that he was in the throes of severe alcoholism, and doesn't remember the lead up to her death or his actions immediately afterwards. He did admit that the writing on the framed print, the blinds and Amber's body did look like his own handwriting. He further admitted that, if Amber had told him that she aborted his baby, he would have been very angry at her, saying that he has no recollection of her disclosing this information. He he also remembers driving in Portland, and has a vague memory of, quote, an exhilarating experience during the police chase. 
David has no memory of entering the nearby woods, but he did say to examining psychologists that he recalls sitting on a box spring, drinking vodka, and taking 20 to 25 pills of trazodone. He also remembers waking up and being rather surprised he was still alive. David's defense was that of diminished capacity. His psychological expert testified that David suffered from an organic brain syndrome, caused by an extensive and severe alcoholic disorder. His attorneys therefore argued that he was incapable of premeditation, and should have been convicted of second-degree murder or even a lesser crime. I think what they were looking for here was first-degree manslaughter. Now, it is wild to learn and believe that David actively tried to suppress evidence in his trial. It makes no sense, because he had made it almost impossible to deny that he had killed Amber. To repeat his chain of despicable actions, he beat and strangled Amber, posed her naked body to take photos, scribbled profane comments on her, stole her credit card and car, purchased a replica BB gun, and then posted her indecent photos to 4chan. He further joked that she had fought so damn hard, confessed to his boss and a friend, told 4chan to watch the news, bragged in a confession note that he had killed her, and even described running from the cops as being fun. Obvious to say, the jury eventually found him guilty of all charges. They further found two aggravating factors in his case. The first factor included a destructive and foreseeable impact on persons other than the victim, and the the second factor centered around his entire lack of remorse. As a result, Superior Court Judge Jeanette Dalton sentenced David Kallick to 82 years in prison, which, by the way, is an exceptionally high sentence when compared to most homicide cases. In response to his sentence, David said, The only thing I can say is I am sorry, and I will never forgive myself. However, despite this, he would immediately appeal his convictions and sentence after his trial concluded. Strange side note, but two years later, and while David was still in prison, he managed to escape his jail cell, break into another inmate's jail cell, and then beat the shit out of him until jail guards arrived. It's no surprise, really. There are people out there that make genuine mistakes and want to better themselves. But as for David, he is not one of those people. He is just an animal that wants to cause harm to others. Anyway, this stunt of his gave him an additional 41 months behind bars. Not that it technically makes any difference. And it's kind of ironic when you think about it, but for a man whose favorite drink is a screwdriver, he clearly has a few loose screws. Eligible for parole in the year 2100, it is safe to say that this sad man will never see the light of day again. The world loses nothing with his incarceration, although his own actions made before his arrest have unfortunately had a very devastating effect. It has resulted in five kids without a mother, a husband without a friend, and a wider family without the one and only Amber Copland. She was a bright young lady who always had a smile for all, along with an always helpful hand for both friends and family. Loved ones recall her as someone who always tried to find the positive in every situation, and her death has had a profoundly negative impact on the lives of her sons. In the months after her death, Amber's youngest child would watch out of the window for his mother to come home. Paul testified that after his son found his murdered mother, it had affected his schoolwork and his relationship with him, his grandparents, and his siblings. He further testified that, in general, he just doesn't seem to like people anymore. To add to all of this, all five of his sons have experienced night terrors after they'd found the photos. I guess this describes one of the most unsavory consequences of the internet. Photos and videos, and even AI-generated media, can now be seen by millions of people against our will. Sadly, this is something I think will only get worse with time, and unfortunately, the consequences can be very severe. Losing a loved one is tragic, but to see one dead is a whole extra layer to recover from. I hope that Amber's family have managed to work through this trauma, and have now found happiness. And so folks, I think that just about wraps up our case today. Thank you so much for being here for another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or you learned something new, please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet, it honestly really does help me out. For early access and extra content, please have a look at my Patreon, and if you'd like to know about more cases or just my adventures, please look at my social media, they're all listed down below. And so we've come to the very end of our video. Thank you again for watching folks, and as always, I'll be back again very soon for another case. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.